has a start head, and in the back it has an end head tag. I wish it was in lowercase. Oh, we didn't? Okay. There we go. Start head, and then in the back, an end head tag. I do wish it was lowercase, uh, but, you know, can't have everything. All right. Today, what we are going to do is we will talk a little bit more about accessibility and tables. Uh, it probably won't go the whole time. Uh, our next topic is forms, and what I would like to do today is sort of set the groundwork and sort of understand how that process works because we're getting into um, a bit of uncharted territory when we start talking about processing forms, and we're getting into a bit of stuff that we won't completely cover this semester. Sort of like the cliffhanger, right? Sort of like in the Hunger Games at the very end when Donald Sutherland with his big white beard looks like, ha, 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 I'll get those darn kids or something like that. I don't know. I don't remember exactly what he said. I'm paraphrasing that. Uh, but uh, at any rate, uh, you know, we got to get you, get you coming back. And there's always something more to learn. So uh, we'll introduce the topic here, and then there's other courses that, that, that deal with it in, in more detail. All right, anyhow, on to HTML tables and accessibility. Um, last time, we, we showed two things that can be used both for accessibility and just for, you know, making the table work a little better. And one of them we talked about was a caption, which is a short description or like a header that would be on the table. And this is superior to having simply like an H1 above it because this is tied directly to that table. It's part of the table. All right, so that makes it a little bit better, you know, than just having a, a header above it where you kind of know that it's associated with the table based on position. This is part of the table. So people accessing it with a screen reader uh, will, um, will, will, will have the benefits of, of, of hearing that too. The other thing is the summary, which I have meant to show is going to be a long thing by putting the ellipsis at the end. That's meant to be a, a long description about, uh, about uh, the table. It's not just meant to be like a line, you know, a sentence or two. It's, it's meant to be longer than a caption. It wouldn't, necessarily, it wouldn't necessarily repeat the data, but it would give a really good idea of, of what the contents of, of it is. It wouldn't necessarily say, like, for January, Atlanta, it's 50 degrees and so on. Let me see if there is. Did I look for screen reader software on this machine? Do you recall? Let's, let's see if there is any. It, it, at some point, it became a standard part of Windows. I'm not sure. This is still running XP, so I don't know if it is or not. Sound can shape your Windows when your show sounds display. Right, right. Oh, it's not. It's not anyone's first choice. All right, let's just put it that way. Narrator. There we go. Yeah, right. You can you you can you can give it different accents too if you want. If you want your computer to be posh and British, you can give it a British accent. Volume's muted. Mute. Check box. Checked. Yeah, we'll check check. Slider. 54. Foreground window. Table. Foreground. Foreground window. Foreground window. Table example Mozilla Firefox. Table example. Document. 
file colon slash 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 c colon slash documents percent twenty n percent twenty settings slash l a b i n s d r u c d r slash desktop slash table dot h t m l read only table example Mozilla Firefox application toolbar 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 grouping status bar table example document file colon slash 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 c colon slash documents percent twenty n percent twenty settings slash l a b i n s d r u c d r slash desktop slash table dot h t m l read only table example document file colon slash slash tab 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 tool tip search tab location table example document pop up start Forward, menu, pop-up menu, end. Tab, location, editable text, file, colon, slash, slash. Let's, let's bring up uh, another example. G -O -G -E. P -C -O -M, enter, table example, document, file, colon, slash, 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 C, colon, slash, documents, percent, 20, N, percent, 20, settings, slash, L, A, B, I, N, S, D, R, U, C, D, R, slash, desktop, slash, table, dot, H, D, M, L, read only, busy, foreground, foreground, win, foreground, window, Google, Mozilla, Firefox, Google, document, HTTP, colon, slash, slash, www, dot, Google, dot, com, slash, Read only. A. M. A. Amazon Google Search. Document. HTTP. Push button. To press. Use space bar. Space. Alright. <laughs> now, again, the, the, the thing that we should window. be clear on is this is no one's first choice of doing it. The other thing that we should be clear on is that this is not a particularly good screen reader. All right, the, uh, this is this is your uh, you know this is your uh, standard. Even I'm sure Windows 7 probably has some improvements over it, or I would think Windows 7 has some improvements over it. This is something that's standard built in. Typically, a blind person would use. Um, there's a couple different one. One of the famous ones is Jaws, which um, is a screen reader. Um, th there's others as well. And again, the idea here is that this is no one's first choice. All right. Um, the person I worked with or that I talked to at NASA, the blind engineer who was a mentor to the, to the blind student, told me if you really want to get the experience, disconnect the mouse, shut the monitor off, and try to access it just with the screen reader. Because that'll simulate what it's like for a, a blind person to, to uh, in integrate with that. You know, and it is again. As I said, it's no one's first choice. But if you had to do it, you'll have you'll do it, right? I mean, it's 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 you know you you do what you have to uh, to, to to do what you need to do. All right. So um, again, I'm also not terribly familiar with that screen reader, so I could have I possibly could have done a better job demoing it. But at any rate, we've seen the summary and we've seen the caption. What I'm going to do now is there's a couple more tags associated with the table that you can use, and they're good for a couple reasons. They're good for one reason uh, is that they help with accessibility. That is, you can put tags around headers, body, and footers. All right. What's a footer? A footer would be like a total that I would have on, on the page. For example, maybe if the very last row of this was maybe the average for the whole United States, you know. So let's go in and let's just make a dummy row at the very bottom. All right. That's different than the other data rows, right? In fact, in this table, this is different than the other rows because it's headings. 
This is the body of the table, and this is different because it's a footer. Um, there's a couple different ways you can, you can represent that. One way you can represent it is with the THs. Another thing that you can do, and you, this does have accessibility implications, it also has um, CSS implications, is you can make, you can put these rows in a T head tag indicating this is the header of the table. You could put the body in a T body tag. And you can put the footers or the totals in a T foot tag. It's just a, an additional way to group things together that maybe will make it more clear. Again, it will make it more clear from an accessibility perspective. It will also make it more clear or also give you sort of the hook that you can style your CSS code. For example, if I want the T foot section to look a certain way, I can go into the CSS and say something like T foot, I want to be um, background blue color yellow and then we get yeah let's go and look thanks and then we can make that footer look different. And in addition, um, because it's, it's in a T-foot tag, uh, people accessing it via screen reader will realize that it's different, that it's, it's part of the footer. It's not really part of the, the main table data. All right. That can sometimes be useful, too. Um, the last thing, the, the, the probably one of the most important things as far as uh, uh, accessibility goes, is giving the screen reader a way to associate a table cell with its respective headings. All right. In other words, if I were to ask you, what does this number represent? It's easy for you to figure it out, right? Because you can go up and see it's February. You can go across and see it's Cleveland. All right. That's easy for you to do. Now, what if someone was reading? that to you and you got a little taste of how the screen reader works and acts and they were reading that to you and it came across and it said 30. You're liable to like, was it, let, let me see, was that the third month? Was that the second month? Is that February? Is that March? Especially like, you know, if you assume we, we carried this further and that all 12 months, it would be real tough to keep track of like what goes with what. Um, in the accessibility resource that we have in Angel here, they, they talk about that as being that the table is linearized. And they, they, they give a, a graphic example of what they mean. Go and look at this. And if we look at tables, they show what it means by the table being linearized. Again, People that can see can instantly see that that is a phone number for Greg, all right, and so on. When the screen reader read it, it's going to read it to you this way, all right. Now, what can we do to help the screen reader along to get the headings right? What we can do is we can 
through a couple attributes, we can associate for the screen reader which cells belong to which headings. In order to do that, we have to first start out by putting IDs on our headings. Now I'm just going to do the first row of this table um, accessibility wise. Do keep in mind our next topic that we're going to talk about client and server scripting. Many of these tables would actually be generated through a program. So you might say, gee, isn't this awful tedious? Well, it's not quite as tedious as you might think because, again, you're not necessarily going to write every um, row of the table. You're going to write a program to do that. And then we can say, ID equals city, or actually Atlanta. Once we've defined, once we've defined the headers for this, these cells, we can then go and using the headers attribute, we can say. And I can do that for the other three columns here. We could also do that for the first column, which I'll go back and backtrack and do. We could say headers equals city. Now, what am I doing here? I'm doing the same thing through these attributes as I would do visually. I'm associating a table cell with the header that, with the headers that, that belong to that cell. So for example, this is the temperature in March, the average temperature in March in Atlanta. So I then have the ID of the March header and the ID of the Atlanta header. So I specify in this headers attribute essentially the row and the column that this belongs to. All right? And I do that via an ID. All right? So I use the ID of the Atlanta cell and I use the ID of the March cell. And likewise down the line. This puts in code what we can see visually, that is the intersection of the, of the row and column. So we know exactly what that cell means. All right? So that's something I want you to do uh, in, in the lab. I guarantee, uh, for the next assignment, I guarantee that a lot of people will forget to do that. And I'll say, code not accessible. And you'll say, well, what does that mean? And I'll say, remember back on March 29th, I said that if you didn't do this, you're going to get deducted. You're going to say, no, I don't remember that. I'm going to say, well, go to YouTube and watch it again. And you're going to say, I don't want to go to YouTube and watch it again. <laughs> Sorry, it's a tough day, all right? But you get the idea. You get the idea. The one with the table. Did you? OK. Uh, well, uh, yeah, you probably should. You probably should put the IDs in. Um, I will, when I grade those, I'll mention that. I do apologize for the timing. I think I'm off a of class because we had the nonprofit in. I think this should have been wrapped up last time. Uh, plus, I talked about the project. So I do apologize for that. But yeah, just go and redo it. Go and add, add the IDs in. And if you haven't done it yet, uh, uh, turn it. I did mention a couple of times, by the way, to go and review that resource in Angel. So um, if, if you had done that, you would have seen um, the discussion of the IDs. But again, I do apologize for that. It happens. Thank you. 
And I'll, I'll, re, I'll show you where it says in this so that you can go back and look. something to refer to on this. Showing correlating table data by table head IDs. All right. Okay. Other questions? All right. Let's spend a minute and look at a couple very popular sites on the web. All right. We're going to look, we're going to spend a minute and look at Google. And we're going to spend a minute and look at eBay. All right? So let's go on and open up Google and eBay. And let's make some observations. So I go to Google. And I type in that I want to look up HTML5. And I press the button. And I see a whole bunch of pages. I see the results for HTML5. Let's say I do the same thing called CSS3. All right. I get information about CSS3. Let's say I do a search for PHP. See all of those pages. All right. Now, let's think about this for a second. Is there a web page out there for every possible thing that I could type in the search bar? No, that doesn't really make any sense, right? That's kind of impractical because how do they know what I'm going to search for? All right? How would Google be even be able to anticipate that? And even if they could anticipate that, how would they know to send me to the right page? You know, pardon me? Time travel, exactly. Yeah, well, that, that's what you need to do to, uh, to correct that lab so that you get uh, <laughs> full credit for it. Travel back in time. All right. But, yeah, uh, there's no way that, that they could have a set of HTML files that are sitting out there waiting for you to ask for them. Right? There's no way that they could do that because who knows what you're going to search for. You, you could put anything in or you could put combinations of things in. Or if you go to the advanced search, you can put in saying, I just want stuff from a particular date range, or I just want stuff from a particular domain, or whatever. So there's so much involved in there that they couldn't, Google couldn't possibly have a result page sitting out there waiting for me. All right? So do we all agree upon that? Let's look at eBay. And... What do we want to buy today on eBay? Let's say we want to buy a digital camera. Do a search for it. First of all, we're back to the same dilemma with, with uh, 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 Google. How does it possibly know that I want to search for a digital camera um, versus anything else? And then, I click on that. Let's say I look and I say, ooh, I think I want to bid on that. That does seem a little high, but we'll, we'll, we'll pretend. All right. Or actually, is that one of them buy now things? Or, yeah. This is yours? OK. Let's go and bid on it. All right, this is the buy it now one. OK, we'll go on this one and bid on it. Yeah. Let's say I go in and I bid um, $101. All right. I'm not going to actually do it because wouldn't that be funny if I like went through this for demonstration and all of a sudden like I end up winning it and I had to like buy this stupid camera. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Let's imagine. Here we're going to use our imagination like SpongeBob. Our imagination. All right. 
let's say I type in a bit of 101 and hit enter, all right? Do you think that someone in eBay headquarters is sitting there, ooh, wait a minute, some guy from Ohio just put a bid in for $101. So I need to go and open up that HTML page in Notepad and go through and change the winning bid from 100 to $101. Probably not likely, right? If you consider all the volume that they do and all that sort of thing, you know, that's sort of a ridiculous scenario, all right? You know, you could just see rooms of HTML developers all sitting there waiting, like, oh, oh, that guy bid, you know. Not, not likely. Let's consider one more. Let's consider one more common website, Amazon.com. How many things do you, could you think you could buy on Amazon? Oh, you know, there very well could be millions of items that you could buy on Amazon. I mean, people usually say millions, like, you know, I have a million things to do today. No, you don't. You have ten things to do today, right? You don't have a million, you know. But there literally could be millions of items on Amazon. Now, let's go and let's, let's look for something. Let's look for a Beach Boys record because summer's coming. All right. We click on that. Here we have a web page. We go and click on another product. We have another web page that looks suspiciously like the first one, right? The only thing different is the specific content is different. If we look at the difference between these two pages, we'd see the format of the two pages is, is the same, you know, even to the point of if we scroll back and forth, we don't even notice that moving, right? Because it's the same on both pages. So both pages have this kind of stuff at the top in common. Both of them have a picture of the record there, the title of it, the price, samples, and so on down the line. Now. Every Tuesday, I think it is, typically is when new records and DVDs and books and stuff come out. Typically it's on Tuesday. It probably happens other days too. But how many new items do you think comes out every single Tuesday? A bunch, right? In the hundreds, if not thousands, all right? So again, every Tuesday morning, is it really a busy day at Amazon Programming Center for them to create all these HTML pages? Well, again, of course not. Well, there, there should be in your mind a bit of a disconnect. Gee, I thought we were learning web development in this class. We're learning how to make HTML pages, but obviously they must be pulling some kind of magic to come up with this stuff, right? Um, and that's absolutely right. They're magicians. That's how it works. Are there any questions? No, no. Uh, of course they're not magicians. What do they do? They imply a technique called server-side programming or server-side scripting to create what are called dynamic web pages. All right, what's the difference between a dynamic web page and a static web page? When you hear the word static, that means unchanging. All right? In other words, if you were to go today, pull out your thumb drive, and look at the lab, the first lab that you turn in for this class, it would look exactly the same as when you turned it in that first week. Likewise, your second lab, your third lab, your fourth lab, and so on down the line. Yet, eBay's page obviously doesn't work that way, right? Because if I place a bid for $101 on that, if someone in North Dakota pulls that up and looks at it, they're going to see the new bid. And if they bid $110, and I go later to check it out, I'm going to see the new price as well, $110. So obviously, something's going on. And we kind of ruled out that people are changing these things manually, right? We said that that, that doesn't make any sense. Or, geez, when you type in a Google search, someone is really quickly coding an HTML page. None of that makes sense. That's all absurd. So what's going on here? How does this work? It's the creation of dynamic pages. Dynamic pages are pages using server-side scripting languages that can respond to changes in conditions. 
one of the key things that it can change based on is input that the user gives us. In other words, if I go in and say, I want to search for HTML5, I get a page of results about HTML5. If I go in and say, I want to search for CSS3, I get a page about CSS3. So it, it is able to notice what I've typed into that form and react to it. All right? The analogy I gave is like this. All right? Think fast food. Think McDonald's versus Subway. All right? McDonald's. You go in to order a Big Mac. Say, I want a Big Mac. What does the server do? What does a person working there do? They turn around, they reach in the bin of Big Macs, they pull it out, they put it in a bag, and they give it to you. All right? In other words, you order a Big Mac, you get a Big Mac. I order one, I get one that's exactly the same as yours, and so on and so forth. The server's job is to just deliver the goods, just to, to find where it is and give it to you. Now compare that to Subway, where you have, what do they call that? Sandwich engineers or sandwich artists, right, that compose and create a sandwich just for you. If you go in and you want to order, you know, a, a turkey sandwich with lettuce and mayonnaise and peppers on it, it's not like there's a bin of those sitting in the back, right? Why not? Well, because that'd be ridiculous to do it that way. Because who knows what people are going to come in and order? Who knows all the different combinations? You know, one person with onions, one person without onions, one person with mayonnaise, one person with mustard. You know, the, 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 just with a handful of ingredients that you have at Subway, the permutations and combinations that you come up with would be astronomical. So they're not going to have one or two of every kind of sandwich sitting waiting there to be ready. But what do they have instead? They have a server who does a little bit more than the server at McDonald's. It's not a server, it's a sandwich artist, right? It's a server, they do more. So what do they do? They have in their mind a recipe for a sandwich, right? So if you order a, what's, what's the kind of sandwich at Subway? Uh, uh, chicken teriyaki. They have in their mind a recipe of how that works, right? They know, like, the basics of the recipe of, what's in a chicken teriyaki sandwich. Where do they get the rest of the information to build that sandwich? From you, right? You say, I want lettuce on it, I want mushrooms on it, I want this, I want that, and so on. So, the sandwich isn't ready in advance. The sandwich is built on the fly based on a couple things. Based on the recipe that the server knows and your input to them about what you want on it. So both of us could order the same chicken teriyaki sandwich. They use the same recipe in their head, but our sandwiches could be very different. You could put onions on yours, and I could not put onions on mine. And either one of us, you know, would choke if we tried to eat the other one, right? So therefore, each sandwich is made more, pretty much custom as a person comes in and orders it. That is like dynamic server-side scripting pages. Now let's move away from food and, and look at uh, this in, in a little more precise technical details. All right? I probably have, driven, have drawn this diagram before. Uh, and I, I draw it in, in most every class that I teach. We have the client. We have the internet, which is typically drawn like a cloud. And then we have what's called a web server. The internet's drawn like a cloud because in this class, we don't really care what goes on in there. <laughs> All right? We just know that if we ask for CNN.com, that somehow our request makes it to CNN's web server. We don't know how, but it makes it there. All right? That's the job of someone else. That's the job of, of networking people in other classes and so on. Well, we don't care about that. We just care that if we make a request for a web page, 
that request somehow magically makes it to the internet and finds the right web server and the response that we get somehow makes it through the internet and comes back to us. All right. Now, when I talk about a web server, I mean a, a, a computer, a system, that is able to respond to requests for web pages. When we talk about a server, we talk about a system that responds to requests. And there's a lot of different kinds of servers you could have. You could have a database server, for example. You could have a web server. You could have a file server. They all handle certain sorts of requests. So it's not really like, you know, a lot of times people just casually say, well, that machine over there is a server. Well, that's not really precise, all right? What kind of server is it? You know, is it, is it your database server? Is it a file server? Is it a web server? And so on, all right? In our case, we're talking about web servers, and web servers run a particular kind of software that allows it to be connected to the internet and listen for and wait for requests. And when those requests come in, they can respond to them. Now, for static pages, the HTML, and again, I'm going to say HTML, but no, when I say HTML, I mean HTML or XHTML, and maybe even some CSS code and the images that comprise a web page, and later on we'll talk about JavaScript. I'm talking about that whole package of files, all right? In the case of a static web page, I make a request, goes through the internet to the web server, the web server finds the files that I've asked for, and simply sends it back to me, and I get it. All right? So this is kind of like the McDonald's model of sandwich making, all right? The sandwiches are sitting there waiting for you. You go in and request some, the server grabs them and delivers them to you. All right? Very straightforward. The server has a minor role in this process. It's simply responsible for finding the stuff that you've asked for and deliver it to you. Now, the implication of this is everyone that asks for that page is going to get the exact same result because it's going to find the same file and send it to that person. And the only way that file is going to change is if someone goes in and manually changes it. In other words, yeah, your lab one file could look different today than when you turn it in. If between now and then you went back and made a change to it manually, but if you didn't touch it, it's not going to change anything on its own. All right. Now, in the case of a dynamic web page, The setup is the same, except the server has a bigger job. And let's back up to look at this one again just for one more second. When I talk about a client, I mean a system that's running a web browser, right? It could be this computer, it could be uh, your phone. It could be a laptop, it could be a video game system that's connected to the internet, any sort of thing like that. All right. Now, the response comes back to the browser in a language that the browser understands. What is the language that browsers understand? HTML. All right. So the browser gets back the language that it knows, HTML along with CSS and maybe some JavaScript. We'll, set, we'll, we'll mention that now. We'll, we'll talk about that more later on. Now, how is it different in the case of server-side scripting? Well, in server-side scripting, there are no completed HTML files. There are recipes, all right, or scripts, or programs, all right? that interact with the server. In addition, 
there's user input that comes in. Do you want lettuce on that? Do you want it uh, toasted? Do you want it, um, you know, wheat bread or white bread? All your user inputs are an ingredient into that. And then there's stuff that comes from other places, most notably a database. And actually, drawing it this way is kind of just a shortcut. Really, there should be a database server in here because typically the web server won't necessarily interact directly with a database. It will it'll interact with another server, a database server. But for the purposes of this class, we can say, well, it, it, it deals with the, with the database. It, it interacts with the database. So there's three things put together. There's my user input, all right? There's the recipe. Another way to say this is sort of like a template. Instructions, uh, yeah, application, a lot of different ways that maybe you could phrase this. That tells the web server how to take the request from the client, the input that the client has supplied, and maybe data from databases or other sources and dynamically on the fly create a web page for the user that gets sent back to them. Now again, this is the same kind of client on the same kind of browser and that response has to be in a form that the browser understands. We have to speak the language of browsers, which is HTML. So if you go to Subway or you go to McDonald's, you leave with a sandwich, right? If you have a static website or a dynamic website, in both cases, the client gets delivered an HTML document, right? It has to, right? That's what browsers understand. So that's the way you have to give your response back to a browser, is in an HTML document. And oh yeah, there can be CSS and other stuff in there too, but it's the same, the results are the same, regardless of whether it is a static web page or a dynamic web page. Now the benefit of this, of course, is that we can now make this interactive, all right? You're not gonna get the same page every time, all right? Is Angel static or dynamic? Dynamic, how do you know that? Okay, because there's an email system. You look at your email today, it's gonna look different tomorrow, or it might look different tomorrow. How else do you know that it's dynamic? Yeah, well I can put stuff into it. You, well you can too, I guess, into the Dropbox. I can add new course materials and assignments and all that. Um, when we log in, when each of us log in, do our screens look the same after we've logged in? No. You're going to show your classes, your page is going to show your classes, my page is going to show my classes. What's more, it's going to know that I'm in the role of instructor and you're in the role of a student. All right? So therefore, our pages may, even if we looked at this class's page, it's going to look a little different, right? Because I can do different things than, than you can do on, on, on Angel. All right? Let's think of if I visited a website for a TV network. Let's just randomly pick NBC. Does this look static or dynamic? Why does it look dynamic? Well, as a search bar, that's a good, good observation. What about this? Well, the, the moving, yeah, that, that's dynamic in one respect. Um, that actually wouldn't necessarily have to be done with server-side code, but yeah, that's another example of it being dynamic. What about this thing here? That'll change based on what day it is. In other words, if we come back tomorrow, it's not going to say that Community 30 Rock, the office, are on. It's going to show whatever's on Friday night. 
What's more, if I click and say I live in Pacific, okay, it's the same time. Let's pick Central time. There we go. It changes the time. It says that, okay, that shows on now at 7 o'clock and 7.30 instead of 8 and 8.30. All right, so that's dynamic. Yeah, exactly. In other words, the question was, is, is it with dynamic issues that some of like these privacy issues come up? And absolutely. Because a static website, same for everyone. You don't supply any credentials. You don't supply any information. You know, is there any privacy issue with any of the pages you've done for this class? No, because you don't ask anyone anything, right? Yeah, so it would be with these interactive things that, that, uh, and dynamic ones. Now, the question is, is how do we go in and create one of these dynamic pages. It should be clear to you that these recipes are not in HTML. Because HTML is not dynamic, right? You look at your web page from the first week, it looks the same now as it did then. You use what are called server-side languages or scripting languages, server-side scripting languages, and these include or platforms, ASP.NET, Java, which is different than JavaScript, PHP, Perl, Ruby on Rails, Python, um, ColdFusion, Flash has a server-side and a client-side component, actually. So it depends on, on, uh, on what you're, you're talking about. But, but there, could be, there could be Flash stuff that interacts with some of these other languages to produce the server-side. But it's done in these languages, all right? These languages are where you write the instructions to create your dynamic web pages. Now, if you think about it, if we go back to the Amazon example, Portions of this page don't really change from product to product, right? That top header is the same, regardless of what page I go to. All right? Really, these recipes are actually a mix. There is some I guess I misspoke when I said they're not HTML. They're not completely HTML. These server-side uh, scripting languages typically are a mix of some HTML stuff plus these server-side languages that fills in the blanks. In other words, there's instructions that say, hey, they pulled up this uh, uh, product, all right, show this image, show this price show this title, and so on, versus they pulled up this product, show this image, this title, this price, this rating, and so on. So some of this page, to be sure, is done in plain old garden variety HTML. Some of it is accomplished via server-side scripting. All right. Uh, sometimes when I mention server-side scripting, People look at me like, why did we spend a whole semester learning HTML only for you to tell me that we're going to be writing these pages, these larger applications, which again, most of your popular websites are dynamic applications, right, or are dynamic web pages. Why did we spend time learning it when you're telling me that we're going to write in some other language? The reason is this. Remember, when you write a server-side script, you're actually writing a program to create an HTML document, all right? As such, you need to know what an HTML document looks like and how an HTML document works, or you'll never be able to write instructions to write those, right? It's kind of like, you know, you need to know how to add yourself before you could write instructions to explain to a child how to add, right? If you don't know how to add, there's no use even trying to write instructions to explain someone, or if you don't know how to 
make uh, a, a roasted turkey. There's no sense trying to write a recipe explaining to someone how you make a roasted turkey. Same idea here. If you don't know HTML, all right, you're not going to be able to use these server-side languages to dynamically create HTML. All right. So what you've learned here is very useful because, again, some of this is going to be static HTML and other parts of it are going to be code in other languages to be sure, but their output is going to be HTML. So you need to know how HTML works. Now, what does this have to do with this class? And I realize I'm going over time, but I do want to say a few more things before we wrap it up. What this has to do with our class is this. All right. We are going to study HTML forms. All right. That is, we're going to study the portion of this related to the client of how we can gather input in a form and send it to a server. We are not going to study the piece of what the server does with it once it gets it. All right. So if we look at this page. This page has a form on it for us to search. We can search by type. We can search by title. And we can search Go. That's the part that we'll, we'll study, how we can create an HTML document that has a form where the user can enter certain pieces of data. What we're not going to talk about is what web servers do with that data. That's uh, contained in other classes. All right. Questions? No. What you're, you're, uh, what, what you're going to do is you will actually submit to a, to a script that I write. So I'll, do, I'll handle the server side part. So you'll handle the client part. In other words, you'll create the form. And you'll handle the connecting of your form to my script. But then my script will go in and output the, the results and do, do what it needs to do. Yeah? Mm -hmm. you, can, you can use either relative or absolute paths. So that's why I've sort of encouraged using relative paths. So for example, if you had a page in a folder called index.html and you had a page in the same folder called aboutus.html, once it's on the server, you could have a link on the one on the home page that simply said aboutus.html. So you wouldn't need to say http colon mydomain.com slash aboutus.html. You could just use a relative path. You could use the other way, the long way of giving the whole path to it. But uh, normally what you do is use the relative path. So yeah, that part stays consistent. And then again, is the one piece that we did not cover, is when you're done putting this up on a web server, um, your, your static HTML documents. All right, other questions or comments? All right, Tuesday we'll start looking at forms. Uh, the assignment for forms was due last Wednesday. No, I'm just kidding. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. We'll see you over at lab. I thought.